All of this is a liquid helium refrigerator that produces liquid helium for the superconducting magnet. And the magnet control room is actually up these stairs, um, and they have their own special computers in order to, to operate the superconducting magnet. So they're actually a barrel toroid, two end cap toroids, and a central solenoid. The central solenoid is built by Japan, so we have probably the world's most complicated magnetic system. Mm -hmm. And it stores an enormous amount of energy. The, the barrel toroid stores about a gigajoule. So it's a huge magnetic field. Actually, everybody who is allowed to come in the cavern will get their retina scanned. And like the CIA, you have to put your eyeball in there to identify you. And then a few people will be allowed to go in uh, for quick access when the machine is operating. And the machine turns off, um, it will cool down radioactively and larger numbers of people can go in. Right now we're, we're lucky because nothing, no radiation, nothing has happened, so everything is very quiet. But when we start operating, it will become much harder to get in. That's uh, a safety sign saying that there is an oxygen deficiency danger. So I've never seen of, such never a thing. Seen thing. That's a yeah. very interesting warning song. For the, uh, I, I would not have guessed lack of oxygen. So we have uh, liquid nitrogen. Yeah. Yeah. We have liquid nitrogen. We have liquid argon. <laughs> Anyway, this is, uh, we're now in the Atlas Cavern. We'll walk on this catwalk from one end of the cavern to the other. And unfortunately, the grand view is blocked. <laughs> so in order to see how large it is, you have to be a little daring and come to the railing and look down to where the floor is. Make sure your hard hat doesn't fall. Right? And then look up, and you can see way up inside the, uh, the cavern, that's one of the access shafts. So, um, unfortunately, well, if you look straight through here, you can actually see um, to the other wall of the detector. So this particular view is much more grand when the end cap toroid, which is this device here, is moved back onto the beam line. At the moment, it's off to the side in order to install the small wheel, which is uh, one of the devices we actually made, contributed to in the United States. So anyway, what you're seeing now are elements of the muon system. Um, this is the, the big wheel, and I think everybody will have to come and, and look just down the, the, the corner to see it. But it's 25 meters in diameter, and you can look right through here, and you'll see a huge wall of I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of trigger chambers. And then behind that are tracking chambers, and behind the tracking chambers are two more layers of trigger chambers. So one of the things that I didn't mention before is that when the protons collide, they're very nonspecific as to how they interact. They mostly produce what we call base events or low bias events or junk. <laughs> and what we're trying to do is to find the really, really important Higgs particle out of this huge number of uninteresting events. So we have to search maybe one part in a billion, or maybe even smaller, in order to see these rare events. So instead of, to make sure that your computing system and your disk space and so on is not overwhelmed by these uninteresting events, we trigger. So we have to develop a very fast electronic signal that tells you that you have something that's potentially interesting in physics. 
So for example, in the muon system, we can trigger on a muon of momentum of 6 jeb or larger, 6 giga electron volts or 20 giga electron volts. And given that, then the, the rate should go way down and we will then write a subclass of events onto, onto disk so that we will be able to see this tiny little signal somehow. So not only does the muon generate uh, system generate triggers, but the calorimeter generates triggers and so on. So each one of the subsystems has a has a very fast um, uh, electronics that uh, looks for interesting signals and then says, Ah, this event is interesting. Let's write it onto disk. Let's analyze it. So one of the things about this collider is that it, it produces it has very very large numbers. We actually have um, a very large number of interactions every beam crossing. When the accelerator is operating, the beams come in sausage bunches, and so they bang, 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 bang against each other like this, and they produce um, a collision once every 25 nanoseconds. And in every of the, each one of those collisions at 25 nanoseconds, when these things bunches collide with each other, there's something like 10 events produced. So you can imagine the enormously high rate uh, of events that we have. So you have to, out of this huge number of, of events, this tremendous flow of particles from the intersection point, we need to, to have fast enough electronics to be able to, have a smart enough trigger, and good enough software to be able to, to catch the rare event. That's right. That's right. Very In fact, the detector is so large that the next event happened before the remains of the previous event has gotten through the detector. <laughs> okay, so everybody come here and have a stare down through here, if you like. If you sort of put your eyeball here, you can see a blue thing roughly in the middle. That's where the beam is. Um, and that's going to be a, a shielding. So the beam comes in from the left and from the right and collides over there. Uh, but you can see the size of the big wheel. This object here is the NCAP toroid, and it is um, very cold inside. This is a cryostat, so it's basically at room temperature on the outside. But on the inside, there are superconducting coils. They're not superconducting temperature now, but they're quite cold. Um, but all of the uh, super insulation and the vacuum insulation uh, makes it so that there's no frost in the outside. <laughs> About, uh, 10 meters or so directly in this direction. Um, so you, unfortunately, you can't see it. You have to, in fact, Atlas is quite a maze. You have to climb in and, and uh, can be very disoriented because you go in these little cat blocks and you can see vast numbers of cat blocks where electronic crates are mounted, uh, uh, lots of cabling is, and so on. And then from those cat blocks, you're able to go in special passages and you can actually go inside the detector. The detector is open. Some of the inner parts are on rails which can be open and you sort of climb in. And one of the most awful things which I don't particularly like to do is in order to get to some inner parts you have to crawl through a hole about this big in diameter. And it's all well lit. <laughs> but if you're claustrophobic, forget it. <laughs> You have to go in, and, and it's, a, it's a real maze to get inside to work. Yeah. 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 And I would have been in high school chemistry were thought of water. We needed about six kilometers in the amount of water and the temperature to be that's right. They're little, they're little hexagons that are made out of plastic, yeah. insulating, and, uh, and, with liquid argon. and it's in liquid argon, so it's about 80 degrees Kelvin. 80 degrees. That's right. Nice and chilly. Nice and chilly. Kind of a giant refrigerator. Form. Yeah. So the other parts of the detector are indicated here. This is um, yeah. a little paper.